2 Corinthians chapter 4, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> We're going to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm just going to go down through this. I'm going to pull out some important things out of this chapter. I got reading this the other day, and I had to keep reading it. And I read it I don't know how many times. And there is so much in this chapter. Did you ever notice there's so much in the Bible? I just, I just, I, I can't, I, I can't get enough of it. Um, every time I think I, I got it all and I know it all, which you know I don't know it all. I hope you know that. I have to remind myself periodically. <laughs> I don't know it all. There's so much I don't know. Just when I think, like, you got to listen to me carefully. When I think that I've got it all down, you know, got it all figured out, yeah, right. I read something and it, everything changes. And then I say, you know what, Lord, I am not as smart as I think I was. Lord, I'm certainly not as smart as I look. Half of you are still asleep, so I don't know what we're going to do. I'm going to have to make you jump up and do calisthenics or something. <laughs> Never mind. There ain't no punchline. Um, anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when you find it, if you'd stand. As I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's only 18 verses, so relax. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. I will read out loud. You don't have to. You just follow along in the Bible as I read. All right? Fair enough? Okay. I would like a few amens today. The more amens, the quicker I get done. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read. You listen up. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who command, commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with him. For all things are for your sakes, and uh, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. <clears throat> for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Father, bless the message. I pray that as it goes forth, that you would use it for your honor and for your glory. Father, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You may be seated. This uh, passage of Scripture says a lot, and it starts off, Paul is kind of reminding the church of Corinth when he says uh, in verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, and have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We've denied or rejected the hidden things of dishonesty, not working in craftiness. Some people in the church of Corinth was accusing Paul of doing things with craft or craftiness. Some people was, they were accusing him of being dishonest to the church. But Paul's saying, listen, I'm not being dishonest. I'm not walking in craftiness. He says, nor walking in craftiness, nor handling of the Word of God deceitfully. What Paul did with the church of Corinth, even though they didn't like some of the things he was saying, he had to rebuke the church many, many times. We see that in, in really in his first letter to the church of Corinth. He was really rebuking the church greatly in that first letter. The second letter, he's not rebuking the church as much. He's actually admonishing and trying to encourage them. But they were accusing him of some things, and he said, look, I, wanna, I just want to set the record straight here. And he says, I'm going to tell you that I am not handling the Word of God deceitfully, but what I'm giving you is truth. But then he tells us in, in that verse 2 and 3, and verse 4, Especially in verse 4, it says, In whom the God of this world, lowercase g, we all know who that is, right? That's Satan. Satan is the God of this world. Hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Folks, Satan is real. The devil, Satan, is real in this world. He has no one to laugh about. He's no one to joke about. He's real. He is working in this world. He's doing everything in his power to turn people away from the truth of the gospel. He's doing everything in his power just to destroy mankind that God had created. He's doing everything in his power to destroy this world that God has created. The devil hates everything that God does. The devil hates everything that God stands for. And let me say this, he hates everything that you do for the Lord and everything that you stand for for God. He'll do whatever he can to draw you away from the truth of the Word of God. He'll do everything he can to destroy your life. Whether it's, you could name, you could fill in the blank of how he wants to destroy your life. And sadly, he's destroyed many of lives that we know of and that we have seen over the years. And he's still attempting to do that. He'll do it right up until he's thrown into the bottomless pit and then eventually into the lake of fire. Let me give you several things here today out of this passage of Scripture, things the devil does not want you to know. There are several things that the devil does not want you to know today. Number one, he does not want you to know that the Word of God is truth. The Word of God is truth. To the lost, the Word has been hidden. We see that in verse 3. In verses 2 and 3, uh, let me just read them again. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not working in crafti walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. The gospel doesn't make sense to the lost. The Bible doesn't make sense to the lost. A lost person, as I've said before, can read this Bible a hundred times and not get it. Just, just not get it. Read it over and over and over again. It just it doesn't make sense to them. <clears throat> it's because those, those, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says. And so we know that to the world, the Bible makes no sense at all. To a lost person that comes to a church service like, like this, and the preacher gets up and preaches, it just doesn't make any sense, or very little sense. To the world, we are a bunch of fools. That's what we are to the world. We're a, a preacher, you're a fool. 
You left a good paying job to become a pastor, to become a preacher that doesn't pay like you used to get paid. To the world, it's foolish. I had a guy that worked for me one time, said, wait a minute, you don't go out, you don't go drinking, you don't smoke, you don't swear. What do you do for fun, he said. This is a, he made really good money where I worked, and, and he was one of the guys that worked for me. But he said, you don't do any of these things. What do you do for fun? You know what I told him? I go to church. <laughs> I says, I go to church. I said, I have fun at church. And he looked at me. He just stepped back and looked at me really weird, like, I just got to get out of your space. <laughs> he, just, he just didn't understand that when we go to church, we can have a good time in church. We can have fun in church. I enjoy going to church. I look forward to going to church. It's the highlight of my week when I go to church. No matter where, if I'm in India, if I'm in Canada, if I'm in Tennessee, where I've been traveling lately, it doesn't matter where I am, but going to church is a highlight of my life. It should be the highlight of your life if you're saved. But to the loss, it just, it doesn't make sense. The Bible doesn't make sense. It's just, it's a book of, you know, philosophy. It's a book of whatever. It's a bunch of Shakespearean writing, and we don't understand the these and the thous, and it's an, it's an old, antiquated book for the old, you know, 400, 500 years ago. It's not for today. This book is not up to date. That's the philosophy, the mentality of a lot of people today. They don't want to believe it. It's not truth to them. It's not something that really matters to them. The world has a better idea to them. Uh, our colleges and our schools and our politicians, they all have a better idea for all of us. And they're going to lead us right. <laughs> no, they're not. This Bible, the Word is truth. And Paul was making that clear to us there in this verse, in verse 2 but have renounced or denied or rejected the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God, what? Deceitfully. This, this Bible, listen, folks, there is not a better book on the planet than this Bible that you, that you have in your lap, and I hope you have a copy of the Bible. You should have a copy of the Bible. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, see one of us after church, and we will give you a copy of God's Word. This is not a foolish book. This is a book filled with truth from the very beginning, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. It is a book filled with truth. Everything you read in this Bible is truth. And so Paul is making that very clear in this chapter 4. He's saying, listen, I want you to know that I don't handle this, this Bible deceitfully. Of course, we know Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And so when you look at his writings, you realize that he was writing what God told him to write. And we have today what God told all of the writers of the Bible to write down. And we have a copy. We have a pure copy of the Word of God today. A pure copy. You should be reading it daily. You should be studying it often. You should bring it to church when you come to church. But to the lost, the Word of God has been hidden. The truth has been covered up by who? Satan has covered up the Word of God so the world can't see it. That's what the Bible tells us. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And so the Word of God is truth. The world says there's no absolutes today, only relative, everything is relative. Based upon what somebody else believes or based upon what you believe. Whatever you believe is okay. It may not be truth, but it's okay what you believe. That's what the world says. Well, if you don't want to believe in, in heaven and a hell, then, then you don't need to believe in heaven or hell. If you don't want to believe in sin, you don't need to believe <clears throat> in sin. If you want to believe whatever it is that you want to believe, it's okay to believe that way. That's what the world says out there. But according to the Bible, there are absolutes. The Bible is an absolute book. It is God's holy, pure, perfect, preserved Word. And God has blessed us with a copy of it. I have a copy of God's Word on this, sitting on this pulpit in front of me that I read every day. God has blessed you with a copy of His Word. You ought to thank God every day for this book. You ought to thank God all the time that He gave you, gave you a copy of His Word. 
but we spend so little time in it. We spend so much time doing everything else. We've got that flat screen thing in our living rooms or bedrooms or wherever they are, family rooms, and we spend so much time in front of that and so little time reading this. We have our computers today. <clears throat> we have our cell phones that are computers, and we spend so much time on those things and so little time reading and studying God's Word. The world says there are no absolutes, and everything is only relative. But let me tell you, the Bible is an absolute book. Yeah. Let me also say this. Heaven is absolute. Yeah. <clears throat> hell is an absolute. <clears throat> there is really a hell. Well, how do you know, preacher? Have you ever seen it? No, I haven't. But I've read about it. Right. And I believe that God would not put it in the Bible if it wasn't true. Right. I believe in a heaven. If I didn't, why, why is it in the Bible? Why would God say there's only one way to go to heaven? If there are multiple ways to go to heaven. All roads lead to Rome, they say. And they also say, the world says, all roads lead to heaven. All you got to do is be a good person. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, where'd they get that from? From the Bible. The Bible says that. But all you have to do is just, just be yourself. Uh, have a great self-esteem of yourself and you'll go to heaven. Just be a good person. That's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one. That's an absolute truth. Amen. One way. It's not through the Baptist church, not through the Baptist preachers, not through the Catholic church or the Catholic priest or pope. It's not through the Methodist church. It's not through the Presbyterian, the Episcopal, uh, Episcopal. It's not through communion. It's not through baptism. It's not through just coming to church. It's through Jesus Christ. He died on a cross for our sins. Amen. And if you don't trust him, listen, I'm sorry and I feel bad for you, but you'll die and go to hell someday if you don't trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is an absolute truth from the Bible. If God didn't want us to know that, He wouldn't have put it in there. So the Bible is an absolute. Heaven is an absolute. Hell is an absolute. Salvation is an absolute. You have to be saved to go to heaven. That's just the way it works. If that wasn't the way it works, why did Christ die on a cross? Why did He, why did he suffer the way that He suffered if you didn't need that? Always oh, bothers me when people say, ah, we can get to heaven any way we want. <clears throat> Do you know that death is, is an absolute? Yeah. Death is an absolute. Uh, it's just, it's appointed unto man once to die and after this a judgment. Death is an absolute. It's going to happen to all of us. Sin is sin. Yes, we can try to change the names of all kinds of sin today, and that's what we do. That's what the world does. That's what humans do. Uh, we don't like sin, and so we, we change the name to protect the guilty. <laughs> That's exactly what we do. We say that drug addiction is just a disease, or alcoholism is just a disease, or this is something else, and this is just an alternate lifestyle, and this is, this is okay, everybody is doing it. And so we, just, we, we, put little, we put little trailers at the end of those things to explain yeah. away what it really is. Right. It's okay just to, you know, to live together and not be married. It's okay for this, and it's okay for that. And we just, we just have all of these things that it's okay, but according to the Bible, it's not okay. Sin is really sin. Our pride doesn't want to recognize that. We don't want to say that we're sinners, even though we are. Sinners saved by grace. We're all sinners saved by grace. Well, if you're saved, you're a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and so are you. If you're not saved, you're just a plain old sinner that's going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved. Yeah. And another absolute is Jesus Christ is God. Amen. That's right. Whether you like it or not, yeah. Jesus Christ is God. Period. Amen. He's Lord and Savior. Yeah. Period. Right. He's the only way to heaven. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 3. Titus 1, 3. <clears throat> Titus 1, 3. 
2 and 3. Titus 1, 2 and 3. Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested His word, his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Amen. Even some Christians seem to be blinded by the wonders of the Bible. Yeah. Some Christians that don't read God's Word are just blinded by some of the things. They, they may be saved. I'm not saying they're not saved, but when it comes to knowing the Bible, they're just... they're. They're kindergartners compared to others that have gone through, you know, the maturity of, of the Bible and, and gone through and, and learned the things of God's Word. I, I hear Christians struggling with different things in their life, and they're struggling with worries. We talked about worries in Sunday school. If you worry a lot, I, I, I'm sorry. I feel bad for you if you worry a lot. Really, for a Christian, we have no need to worry about anything at all. We're just supposed to be praying about everything. But we worry too much. 32.3% of all adults in America are plagued by this thing called worry. And, and mental illness, I'm going to wrap myself up in this wire here. I'm going to tie myself up and trip on myself probably. Uh, but mental illness is due to primarily worrying all the time. Because people just... That's what they love to do. Their pastime is worrying. But Christians don't have a thing to worry about. Look at John 17 in verse 17. John 17, 17. John 17, 17. <clears throat> is the Bible truth or not? Is the Bible God's word or not? The Bible says in John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. truth. Is that an absolute? Yes. Of course it is. Of course it is. But you know, the devil doesn't want you to think that. Right. What has he done to try to destroy God's word? Yeah. How many different versions are there on the market right. today? Hundreds, I've, I've lost track, I don't know. Hundreds of different versions out there on the market that has removed the blood of Christ, yep. removed the Trinity, removed that Jesus Christ is God, has changed different verses, different passages, just removed words and phrases and just to make it read what somebody else wants it to read. The Word of God is still pure in the copy that we have, in our King James Bible, but all the other versions out there have, have literally watered down the Word of God to make it say what some people wanted, some men or whoever wanted it to say. Jesus said, again, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We need to have the entire Word of God to know that we have the truth. Psalm 119 verse 18 says this, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We need to ask God to open our eyes when we read. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Right. Lord, help me as I'm reading this book. This is a spiritual book. Okay, I, you know, I've, I'm almost done with this book here. And this is not a spiritual book, even though there's a lot of verses, a lot of scripture in this book. It's not the Bible. Right. And Brother McDonald will be the first to tell you this is not the Bible. Don't read this more than that. Sam Gipp always said that. Don't read my books more than you read the Bible. These, aren't, these, are, these are books that will help you. These are commentaries that will help you to see the truths from the Word of God, but it's not, it's not completely Scripture. You know what I'm saying? When I read this book, I need to ask God to open my eyes to the truths from the Word of God. I need to ask Him, Lord, show me spiritual things from Your Word. That's what we all need to do. Again, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Look at Acts 29. Acts 29. Oh, I'm sorry, 26. 26. 
I think it's 26. I wrote down the wrong scripture, and that's not like me. <clears throat> but I got it. I found it. 26. Acts 26. There's not an Acts 29. Are you sure? That's, that's, my, that's the other version, yeah. Why did I write Acts 29? Oh, the 9 is, is inverted, right? Wait a minute. Oh, that's a, that's 20, that's a 6. I just have to look at it upside. That's a 6. Whew. All right. Let's see if we can figure this out. Look at verse 16. This is what Jesus was telling Paul. He was giving his testimony here. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Look, look what he says in verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may, for, uh, they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among, uh, among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Paul makes it very clear as Christ was telling Paul, this is what you're going to do. You're going to preach the word. You're going to give the word of God out to both Jew and Gentile. And the purpose is, is to open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to light, to give them the hope of the truth to remove them or release them from the power of Satan unto God. Satan does not want you to know that the Word of God is truth. He does not want you to realize and, and put your faith and trust in a book. He wants you to do something else. This is God's truth. This is what we know is truth, that, and He doesn't want us to know that. Amen. The second thing He doesn't... Go back to our scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The next thing that we see that he doesn't want us to know in verses 3 and 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He does not want people to know about the glorious gospel of Christ. He'll do everything in His power to shut down the glorious gospel or the gospel message. That's why you and I sometimes don't pass out the tracts. We don't invite. We don't visit like we should. The gospel saves souls. Doesn't it? The devil doesn't want that. He doesn't want souls saved. He doesn't want you to witness for the Lord. He doesn't want you to give somebody a gospel tract. He'll do everything in his power. Instead of you going out and making sure your pockets are full of tracts, he'll make sure that you forget them on the way out. That you don't have a gospel tract when you desperately need one. Have you ever been in that situation? Yeah, I have. Well, who do you think's behind that? I think it's the devil. Think what you want. The gospel saves souls. He does not want you and I to spread the glorious gospel that Paul is talking about. He said, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan doesn't want us to support missions. Satan does not want you to be part of a missions program here in our church. He does not want you to give to missions. Oh, he says, don't, don't do that. You can use your money for other things. Matter of fact, he'll tell you don't even tithe. Forget that tithing thing. That's an Old Testament, old practice. You don't need to tithe. You need all the money that you have. You just need it. You've got to pay your bills. How are you going to pay for your cell phone? How are you going to pay for your cable or satellite? God forbid we shouldn't have any of that. Can't live without a cell phone, can we? Or can we? Many, many years ago, there wasn't any cell phones. We got along in life just fine. Right, Buck? We didn't go out of the house when we were kids. Where's my 
my cell phone. I don't have my cell phone. I got to have my cell phone. We went out of the house just playing. And hey, when it got dark, we came home and ate. It was a very simple way to live. Didn't have all this crazy stuff that we have today. This technology is just barely had. I don't. Back then, we didn't even have computers back then. They were out there in the world somewhere, but we had no idea what a computer was. We didn't know what a color TV was in our day. Oh, we've come a long way, haven't we? To the better? No, I see what cell phones are doing to kids today. They are destroying our young people today. Cell phones are destroying little kids today, young people today. They are addicted to these things. I have one in my pocket, and you probably have one there somewhere too. Oh, TJ sent me a text earlier. It's very difficult to live without these things nowadays. We go out of our, out, out of our house and we forget them. We, we, go, we go spastic. We go crazy. I forgot my cell phone. I got to turn around and go back and get it. They're destroying lives today. They can, have, they can be of help. They can be of good. But they are, I think, more times than not, they're destroying lives and harming people. Satan does not want us to know about the glorious gospel of Christ. The gospel saves souls. The devil does not want that out. He wants us to be quiet. As I was saying a little while ago, you don't need to tithe. You've got your bills to pay. You've got money that you need. You've got to, you've got to have all this. You don't need to tithe. And certainly, what do you want to give the missions for? Missions is just something. Somebody else will take care of missions. We just came back from Canada and preached a missions conference from brother, uh, for Brother Fair and his church up there. Here is a missionary that we support that already has two missionaries that he, they're supporting, and they want to take on more missionaries. A missionary wants to support more missionaries. Wait a minute. That does, that, that does not compute. <laughs> that, does that make sense? Yes, it does. You know what Brother Fair told me? He says, I love missions. Now, you say, well, he's a missionary. He should. Well, he's, a, he's pastoring a church, and he's trying to teach his people that the right thing to do is support missionaries, right, right. Right. even in a mission church. Right. He said, I just, he says, I can't wait that we take on more missionaries. He's got a small little church, financially struggling. I know they, I know they are. But he's, his heart is to see more missionaries supported. They had a missionary family there when we were there, and he wants to take that missionary family on. And they did the faith purpose giving like we do, and they're, they're, he's going to wait a few weeks and then uh, give out the cards, and then they're going to fill them out like what, what we did at the end of September. Uh, that's what they're all working on. I tried to help them with that, and that's what I was there for is just to try to you know, be a blessing to them uh, with all of that stuff and, and encourage him and the church to be mission-hearted. And that's what we need, because the gospel is getting out. When we support missionaries, and then they in turn support missionaries, the gospel is getting out. Isn't that what God wants? Does, does Satan want that? He doesn't want you to give to missions. He doesn't want you to tithe. He doesn't want you to do anything. Matter of fact, he didn't even want you here today. He didn't want you to come. He didn't want you to come to church today. Some of you said no to the devil, and you said yes to God, and you came to church. There's a whole bunch that says no to God every week. There's a whole bunch out there that says, nope, nope, not going to church today. Don't care about it. Don't care. i got other things to do. But you decided to come to church. Satan's not happy with you at all. Satan does not want you to know the glorious truth of the gospel. He doesn't want you to know about the word of God. He doesn't want you to be concerned about the lost. There is power in the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 1. You know the verse, Romans 1, 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. <clears throat> for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
And we know that the gospel changes lives. You know what I'm doing right now? Look up here. Look what I'm doing right now. What am I doing right now? I'm looking at people that their lives were changed by the gospel. I'm glancing at all of you. And the gospel did something in your life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Passed away, behold, all things have become new. I'm looking at people that had their lives changed because of the gospel. Yes? Was your life changed because of the gospel? The gospel changes lives. You think Satan's happy with that? Not at all. He's not happy at all that you got saved. But then secondly, he's not happy that you're living for Christ. He's not happy that you pick this Bible up every day and read it. He's not happy that you're praying. He's not happy that you're trying to witness. He's not happy that you're trying to be faithful to God. So he'll do everything in his power to try to stop you from being faithful to God. He will bring things up on a Sunday morning to try to keep you from coming to church. He'll get you and the family arguing on the way to church. You know, fighting all the way. And then you pull into the church and... Pick up your Bible and grab it. Come on in. Well, boy, I'll tell you what. He'll, do it. he'll have a field day with you before you get here. Right. Somebody will cut you off. You'll get all mad. Get mad at your wife, mad at your husband, mad at the kids, mad at the dog, mad at the cat, mad at the bunnies, mad at whatever you got in your house. I don't know. Chickens, mad at your chickens, mad, mad at the horses, and mad at the cows, and mad at... You're going to be mad at something before you come to church. He'll do everything he can to get your heart not right with God. And it works many times. Because he doesn't like it when you come to hear the Word of God preached. He'll do everything in his power to keep you from coming back tonight to get the rest of this message. Everything in his power. He'll make you tired later. I just can't get up and go to church. I just can't do it. And then, God forbid, Wednesday night comes along. Wednesday night. There's got to be something on TV that I really like to watch. I have no clue what's on on Wednesday night. Don't know. I'm in church at 7 o'clock. Could care less what's on TV at 7 o'clock. Could care less. I've said this many times. I wish God would do it just once. Blow up every TV. (laughs) Boom! Sunday morning, well, 10 o'clock, boom! Sunday night, 6 o'clock, TV. How come the TV's not working? TV's not working. 7 o'clock Wednesday night, the TV's not working. I'm not saying he's got to blow them up, but just shut them down for... (laughs) A couple hours Sunday morning, a couple hours Sunday night, a couple hours Wednesday night. Wouldn't that be neat? That would be neat. How can we do that? How can we figure that out? We've got to figure out how we, we, got to figure out how we can do that. Make sure your car starts, but the TV shuts down. That would be good. The devil does not want you here. The devil does not want you reading your Bible. The devil does not want you praying. The devil does not want you witnessing. The devil could care less about anything that God likes, loves, or wants as long as he can keep you and I from it. We see in our text, and I got to stop. I'll pick up tonight and we'll continue this. But we see here, first of all, that Paul makes it very clear in the early verses of this one chapter that the Word of God is truth. The devil does not want you to know that. Secondly, again, the glorious gospel is only hid to them that are lost. The God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. He is doing everything in his power to shut down the gospel. Everything in his power to shut it down. If you're here today and you're not saved, He'll do everything He can to keep you from coming forward if that's what God wants you to do or talking to one of us before you leave here today 
about being saved. If you're not saved here today, you need, to, you need to get saved before you leave this place, before you get in your vehicle and drive home, because you have no guarantees. You have no guarantees how much longer you're going to live. Maybe as a young person, you can assume you're going to live a nice long age, you're going to be old, and, and I'll get saved later on in life. I'll just I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. You don't know how much longer you have to live. None of us do. I'm glad I don't know when my appointment would be or is with God. I'm, I'm glad I don't know. I'm glad it's going to be a surprise. Yeah. It'll be a surprise. But Satan does not want you to get saved today if you're not saved. <clears throat> Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Satan doesn't want you to come back tonight. God does. Amen. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. What does that say? Be in church. <laughs> it's pretty much what it says. Folks, what I'm trying to tell you here is very simple. There are some things the devil does not want you to know. And we've only looked at a couple of them. We've got a bunch more tonight. So I'll see you tonight. I'll be here, will you? Some very important things we're going to look at tonight. We're just scratching the surface here in this chapter but we'll look at some more later. Father, thank you again for the Word of God, and thank you, Lord, for the blessings you've given to us. Lord, we do pray and ask that you would bless this invitation time. We don't, I don't know what your will is for people here, and I don't know who's here as far as those that are saved, those that are not. But, Lord, I know that you know. And so I pray that if there is a lost person in this room, or even maybe somebody listening online right now, that they would bow their heads and their hearts and trust you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray as Christians we would be obedient to your word. We would not let things hinder us from what we're supposed to be doing for you, Father. Please bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen.